that uh, there's some aspects to scripture. Let me let me try to drop back and start over here. There's some elements of the scripture where God is waiting for um, a certain response from His people. There are some ad aspects of scripture where God um, moves in various different ways, different forms, different means. There are sometimes, though, in Scripture, there are principles that are brought up that work pretty much universally. Um, one of those principles being, whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. That is a biblical principle, right? You, sow, you, you plant tomato seeds, you're going to get tomato plants. You plant corn, you're going to get corn. Um, if you sow to the flesh, you're going to reap corruption from the flesh. If you sow to the Spirit you'll reap, according to Scripture, eternal life. That's a principle. It's a biblical principle. Um, it's also a principle that applies whether you're a Christian or not. You don't have to believe whether or not it's going to work, because it works. It's simply a principle. You can't get around it. It's like gravity doesn't only apply to those who believe in it. Gravity applies to everybody, whether you believe in it or not. I want to talk uh, for just a few minutes this morning a biblical principle um, on deliverance. Well, let's, let's go ahead and get into Biblical principle on the power of, uh, on deliverance and the power of bondage. You know bondage is strong. I wouldn't call it bondage if it wasn't. Bondage there by being slavery. Slavery is a powerful institution. It, it cripples, it handicaps. It also creates a dependence. This is something we don't think about, but it creates a certain dependence in that people who are bound in slavery or bound in bondage become almost content with their condition. And late and during time, during the process of time, they will almost become dependent on their condition. So you start off as a slave, then you become content with your slavery, then you become dependent. You need your bondage. You need your slavery. This is a principle that we find in the world working around us. From John chapter 5, many of you have heard this story. Uh, so, and I'm going to tell you that you're not, going to get anything, you're not going to get anything new out of the Scripture. There's a limited amount of Scripture there. You're going to end up hearing some of these told over and over. But the principles that come from them can be fresh. It can be new because the Word of God is alive. It is living. It is living. It's quick and powerful. Now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of impotent folk of blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first after the troubling of the water stepped in was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. And a certain man was there which had an infirmity thirty and eight years, 38 years laying by this pool of water. First of all, I want to um, give a little bit of uh, a brief historic reference. Um, when I was looking this up, there uh, it was said that for many years, for centuries, people didn't believe that the pool of Bethesda actually existed. There was no, they, they were unable to find it. Um, what what the scripture uses as the term porches is actually what the Romans uh, in Greco-Roman architecture is called colonnades. In other words, they were big columns with a roof over top of it. Um, this pool with the colonnades around it would have been an impressive structure in Jerusalem. And they thought, well, since we can't find this, it must not have existed. And so they actually utilized this to refute the book of John. Until the middle 19th century, where they actually found a colonnade-lined pool 
near the Sheep Gate in Jerusalem. I'll tell you, if you're looking to science to prove the Scripture, you're looking in the wrong direction because in everything that I've ever seen, eventually the science will come around and show the Scripture was right all along. What we need to do is first we start believing this. Everything else will catch up. If you're waiting for somebody to prove to you that Noah's flood was global, start believing that the flood was global and then just wait for science to catch up. Eventually they will. Eventually they will. And if they don't, it's because they've got their own agenda. They don't want to prove the Bible true. Folks, if you're looking to the mass media for your faith, the same mass media that is des that is bent on destroying your faith, if you're looking to the uh, Discovery Channel to prove that these... You're looking in the wrong direction because they're the ones that are trying to prove that evolution works and that the Big Bang happened. How are you going to get biblical truth from them? Hollywood cannot make a movie that is going to be close enough aligned with Scripture that's going to give you any faith. I, do I say you can't watch these movies that come out of Hollywood? No, I'm not saying that at all. But if you're looking to them to give you some kind of warm fuzzy about the Bible, you're wrong. Right. The Bible's going to have to stand on its own. And it's been doing so quite well for a millennia now. And so we don't need your help. It don't need Hollywood's help. It don't need the USA Today. It will stand. And when the whole world falls apart, the Word of God will still stand. And so when we look at these things, we know that uh, people say, well, the Gospel of John must be true because there, there's part of it. I didn't need them to prove it was true. It was already true. Bethesda. Bethesda. One of the things you'll find out throughout uh, Scripture, um, there's Hebrew words, and once you start getting, uh, starting to understand little Hebrew words, you can put, put things together. The word Beth, does anybody know what the word Beth means in Hebrew? It means the house of. So every time you see Beth with something else after it, it means the house of blank. Beth Lehem means house of bread. Beth El means house of God. Beth Heseda, which actually is B E T H and then H E S D E. I don't speak Hebrew, so there, you're just going to have to go with the hillbilly version of it. The word actually comes, it's two, two root words, two Hebrew word, root words, meaning house of and Heseda. We'll just throw it out there like that. Hasetah is one of those weird words in Hebrew. It does not truly translate into English. It doesn't have a complete translation. If you get, if you read some people's writings, you only get like a, a snapshot of what it means. Hasetah actually is like an intersection or a crossroads of two different ideas, grace and mercy, and reproach and shame. It means both. Now we can't really rightly comprehend that because we want our words to mean one thing so that we can get, them, get, a, get our mind wrapped around it. My mind is very linear. I see everything in a straight line. When these, when these artistic... Uh, concepts come into my mind, it immediately tie goes into brain overload. How can it mean grace and mercy and reproach and shame at the same time? I believe that the Pool of Bethesda actually brings that completely to bear in its very nature. First of all, the Bible says that there was constantly people there of all kinds of disabilities, infirmities. It was a place that was frequented by individuals who were sick. Now in the Jewish, um, in that ancient culture, to be infirmed, to be impaired, was to be outcast from society. 
And we, we get better pictures of this in like the Greeks and the Romans where they would actually be, um, it, was not, it, was, it didn't, didn't mean anything to kill one of them. They didn't, they didn't think twice about killing somebody who was an outcast from society. Their life had no value. Even in Hebrew society where um, God had given in, in the law that the stranger and those who were uh, actually um, infirmed were to be taken care of, the ancient civilization, the ancient culture still marginalized them. They were pushed off to the side. People actually made a living from beggars. In other words, you can't get around. I'm a strong, strapping young man with a mind to make a buck. So, what do I do? I, I get this old hovel somewhere, and I let you live there. Every morning, I go to the hovel, I collect you, and I take you out to the street corner. I lay you down, give you a tin cup. You collect alms through the day. At the end of the day, I take the alms that you collect, carry you back to the hovel, and now I've made my profit. Sounds pretty wrong, don't it? But hey, we don't have the uh, we don't have the corner on the market of being absolutely wrong in our thinking. Uh, people have been thinking wrong for years and years and years. Anyway, this man been at this particular position for thirty eight years. Now, there's it'll beg a question: in thirty eight years, how many people has he seen come through? that colonnade. Now, this man's probably at least 50 years old because he would have lived in his parents' house to at least 12, which was when most young Hebrew boys would have been bar mitzvahed into a manhood. So he would have lived in his parents' house until he was at least 12, maybe longer than that considering his infirmity. 38 years he'd laid here. Can you imagine that? He laid in that position long, in, in that position almost as long as I've been alive. In January, I turned 40. He'd been, he'd been in that situation for what I would consider most of my life. And during that time, he'd seen many people. He had also learned the particular timing the season. The Bible says that there was a season where an angel came and stirred the water. And the first one in received the healing. <laughs> Moving on. When Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been now a long time in that case, he saith unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? I want you to remember that question. The impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool. But while I am coming, another steppeth down before me. Thirty-eight years, watching the, and watching the season come, watching the waters be troubled, and he had not yet learned at what time to be close to the edge of the pool. Could it be now, this is not going to be scriptural. This is my, my thoughts. This is an appendix to it. But could it be that he had become content and complacent with his condition and simply resigned himself to the fact he wasn't going to get any better? When he was asked, Wilt thou be made whole? He didn't say, Yeah, I want to get better. He said, I can't get better. That's what he said. Isn't it? I boil things down. I like the, I like things at the, I like things boiled down neat and where I can comprehend them. And what his excuse basically says is, I can't. I can't do it. The every time somebody beats me out, we in the church come across this all the time. Maybe we in the church are doing this all the time. See, the Lord asks us, "Do you want to get better?" And what is our excuse? I was born this way. Well, this is just the way I am. Yeah. 
Nobody's perfect. Huh? We at we 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 show up at the right place. See, the guy was at the pool. Was there a possibility of getting healed there? Yes, he was at the right place. But he had gotten to a point where he had become so convinced that he was not going to get better that he had resigned himself to his infirmity. And so he's in the right place and not getting anything from it. There's churches today. People are in the right place. They're sick. They're infirm. They're in need. And they're getting nothing from it. Because in their mind, they have contented themselves with their condition. And so when the preacher gets up and preaches, he's not, he's not necessarily combating all hell. He's combating that person. Because you take away my sickness and I ain't got nothing left. I've come to rely on that. That has been a constant in my life. That problem, that issue, that thing that has kept me in bondage, it's better to be in bondage to what I'm used to than to be freed to something I'm not prepared for. There's many a people who find themselves in that situation. And we say, well, why can't I get delivered? It may be that you don't want to. And that's hard to deal with. It's hard for me to deal with. It's hard for us to look in the mirror and say, the one that's keeping me sick is looking back at me in the mirror. But it may very well be that your, your worst enemy is yourself. Wilt thou be made whole? Jesus saith unto him, Rise, take up thy bed and walk. And immediately the man was made whole and took up his bed and walked. And on the same day was the Sabbath. If you continue reading John chapter 5, you find out that the guy he just made whole stirs the pot almost against Jesus. Almost seems to be ungrateful. The people jump him. Why are you carrying your bed on Sunday? You're not supposed to be doing it on the Sabbath. It wasn't Sunday on the Sabbath. Why are you doing that? You ain't supposed to be doing that on Sunday. Well, the guy that healed me told me to do it. Man. <laughs> it's not my fault. Instead of saying, look, guys, 38 years I've laid and couldn't even lift up my hand to scratch my nose, and now I'm carrying my bed. I don't care what you think. You get out of my face, I can carry my bed and I'm going to carry it from now to Christmas. I'm going to carry it and I'm going to show everybody. But no, what do they do? Well, he told me to do it. Come on. Really? That's great. That's really good. Preferring bondage to liberty. Exodus chapter 14, verse 12. If you read Exodus, Exodus makes me mad. Exodus makes me absolutely angry, infuriates me. Israel is a good cross-section of humanity. Because every time something just don't go just right, Israel gives up. Not only do they give up, they threaten to stone people, and they threaten to go into just all kinds of tirades. They're like a bunch of infants, a bunch of children. They just go, they pitch a hissy fit. Is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, Let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? For it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than we should die in the wilderness. It is better for me to live in bondage than to die free. What? Isn't that what that says? Come on, that's, I know it's a hillbilly translation, but when you put it in the... It's better for me to live in bondage than to die free. And that's how most people see it nowadays. Did you know that when the American, the American Civil War, many of the slaves who were liberated did not leave their master's homes because they did not know what freedom felt like? They could not understand, they couldn't grasp the concept of living free. That was all they had known. 
Folks, many of us have lived in bondage for so long, we don't know anything else. And we're quite content with our bondage. And we've gotten to the point where when Jesus says, Wilt thou be made whole? We're saying, well, it depends. <laughs> it depends what exactly you go, what, what, what do you mean by being free? Here's one for you. Let me, I'm going to have to jump ahead just a second. Give me a second. Work with me. <laughs> Recidivism. Does anybody know what recidivism is? Recidivism is um, the reincarceration of those who have been previously put in jail for a crime. I had all kinds of statistics here. I'm not going to read all those. What it, the long and short of it is, within five years, three quarters of the people who have been convicted and put in jail for a crime are back in jail. Do you know what one of the number one um, reasonings for that is? They feel safer there. They cannot adjust to life outside of prison. In prison, they got three hots and a cot. I've never been in jail. The, hash, the thought of being in jail scares me to death. But the fact is that there are some individuals who have chosen that they would rather live in that bondage where somebody tells them it's time to get up and it's time to go to bed. It's time for meals. They don't have to supply the meal. The meal's provided for them. They can get a college education in the big house. They can get all their workout equipment. If I want workout equipment, I have to go out and buy it. It comes a handy place to hang my clothes. Anyway. <laughs> but the fact is that people have chosen that they would rather live in bondage than to live free. Individuals who are liberated from substance abuse often find out that this whole thing of living without that medicated haze ain't all that they were thought it was going to be. And they'd just as soon go back to it. Individuals who are going through programs need to be told when you, come, when you come out of this, uh, these substances, out from under the bondage of these substances, real life is going to slap you in the face. And you need to be prepared for it. We don't seem to realize, because we've all, most of us have been living this real life for a long time now. Can you imagine coming out, of, out from under the fog of medications and substances to have real life slap you and you wasn't ready for it, but they won't in these 12-step programs to make you think that everything's going to be peachy. It's not. Life is rough. And people come out from under the bondage of this and go, oh! This is horrible! I'm going to have to work! I can't believe this. I'm going to have to raise my children. Folks, that ain't easy. You make mistakes. That's my daughter. That's my son. We've made mistakes. You're going to find out that there's bills to be paid. And for every minute you work, somebody's got their hand out to take it from you. All the world, they want money, and then they get mad at you if you don't give it to them. And so people that come out from under bondage, they find themselves in this, and many of them, just like Israel here, I'd have just as soon stayed in bondage. This is what the church is up against nowadays, folks. That's, why are we not winning the battle? Because we're not painting a reality to these people. We're not showing reality. We're showing rainbows and butterflies. It's not. I don't live in with rainbows and butterflies, neither will they. The problem is that they're coming out from under something that makes them think that they're living with rainbows and butterflies. And then when there's storm clouds, and when things ain't going right, they go, I want the other. 
Galatians chapter 4, verse 7 through 9. I'm going to get into the principle, the biblical principle. There, wherefore, thou art no more a servant, but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. How be it then, when ye knew not God, ye did serve, uh, you did service unto them which by nature are no gods. But now, after that ye have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements, whereunto ye desire again to be in bondage? You served sin. You served the flesh. You served that which claimed to be a God, but was no God. That's what, it, that's what he says. It claimed to be a God. It claimed to lord over you. And if you find out most tyrants, most of these dictators and tyrants are little shrimps with a lot of power. They're about half nuts, maybe completely nuts. Have you ever, have you seen them? Have you read biographies? I've read biography, biography, I can't even say it. I have read biographies of Napoleon. I've read backstories on Adolf Hitler. I've done some study on Kim Jong-il. These little tyrants, that's all they are. They're little people with little people complexes and they want all the world to be afraid of them. But in, the, in reality, there's nothing there. There's nothing to them. It's all front and show. No offense to the little people in here. <laughs> I didn't want to make Sister Linda mad at me. <laughs> But chapter 5 says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. This is the biblical principle. Stand firm. It's not going to be easy. If it was easy, anybody could do it. You're going to need Christ's help to do it, but you need to stand in liberty. You need to make up your mind. It's better to live in liberty. It's better to fight in liberty. It's better to die in liberty than it is to live under the oppression of bondage. As, as Patrick Henry said, give me liberty or give me death. In this world, we need to have that same resolve spiritually. If we were willing to fight in this nation for independence from England, from Great Britain, and if you look at our history, look, what have we done? We have re-enslaved ourselves. This country is now re-enslaved to a completely different government, but it's, we're just as bound as we were before. You don't think so? We're, you're now paying more taxes than what caused the Boston Tea Party. <sighs> Did you know that? Between 30 and 40% of your income goes to taxes. It was about 20 to 25 percent that caused the, uh, the colonials to revolt against England. There's one for you. Oh, but we're free. They can call it what they want. We are not free. We're just under a different form of bondage. And in this world, you will not find true freedom. Every time there is a revolution, the French, the French Revolution. They became under the bondage of... They went from a monarchy to a socialist state. The communist revolution of Russia overthrew the Tsar and became under the bondage of the communist regime. You trade one bondage for another. One bondage for another. You look at Israel. They left the bondage of e Egypt. And by and by, they rejected God and went under the bondage of legalism and the Pharisees. They did. We trade one bondage for another. But in our spirit, we can be free. No matter what... Paul and Silas found themselves in prison, and we're still free. <laughs> they were strapped in stocks, in a cell. They'd been beaten within an inch of their life, and they were still free enough to sing. 
I'd like to take that for a moment. If we want true freedom, it's got to be a spiritual freedom. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 17 through 22 says this. These are wells without water, clouds that are carried with a tempest, to whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lust of the flesh, through much wantonness, those that were clean escaped from them who live in error. What does that mean? There are people out there that are trying to suck you back in. Folks, be careful who you associate with. Oh, well, I'm going to, I'm going to influence them toward the Word. That happens sometimes, but most often they're sucking you backwards. That's the way it works. Folks, you need to surround yourself with people of like faith. Go out into the darkness, carry the light with you, but you need to be coming back to the people that believe like you believe. Those need to be your friends. Those need to be your acquaintance. That needs to be your family. Is the people who are edifying and uplifting because there are people out here that are wells without water. They promise something good and there's nothing good in them. They're a cloud that promises rain, but it's nothing but a cloud driven by a wind. And they allure with, they, what is it here? For when they speak great swelling words of vanity. What's that? Solomon defined vanity as emptiness, a complete vexation of your spirit. They allure through the lust of the flesh. In other words, they find out what is enticing to you. And those, they allure them. Those that were clean escape from uh, them who live in error. What does that mean? Who are they talking to? Us. We're the ones who have clean escaped. We're the ones who got out. They're not trying to draw the others back in. They're already there. They're trying to get you to come back. The principle is that you have to stand firm. We have got to make up our mind that we're going to live free. While they promise them liber liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption. For of whom a man is overcome of the same is he brought into bondage. They promise you liberty. They promise you, oh, this Christian faith is nothing but rules and regulations. We're free from that. We have been enlightened. Really? Are they truly enlightened? Are they truly free? They're bound by fashion. They're bound by trends. Oh, I would never wear that. That was so last fall. Have you seen that? I have no idea about any of that. I wear what I want to wear. But the fact is that there are people who are bound by trends. They're bound by fashion. They're bound by tradition. They're bound by what they think is freedom, but it's truly a bondage. These people, I'm an individual, just like a thousand others that look just like them. Only in Christ do we find true liberty. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein, and overcome, the latter end is worse than with them than the beginning. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. I'm going to emphasize this real quick, and I'm, I'm going to be done. It's better for us not to get these people to just come down here and put springs on their knees and bounce at the altar and walk back than it is for them to come... To, to never have come in at all. Why do you say that? Because they come down here and we tell them, you're saved, you're good to go, everything's good with you. And they go out believing that, and they've not changed. They're not a new, they've not been transformed. They're not a new creature, but now they think they are. And now you try to w reach them. And what do they say? Well, I'm already saved. I remember going down bouncing at the altar. Ain't that what the Bible just said? It's better for them 
for it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they had known it to turn the holy commandment deli- uh, turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. It's better for a person not to pretend to get saved and go back. It's better for a person not to have gotten saved and return to the world. Have you, has anybody tried to reach? And I know that there's answers in this. There are people in this congregation who have tried to reach a backslider. One who has backslidden from the faith. One who has completely rejected God and knew God. They are more vehement against the gospel than anyone else. The vitriol, the the acid that drips from them as they try, as they go against the word of God, they hate it because it reveals to them where they've come, fallen from. And the Bible says it's better that they never come to the altar at all, folks. The church has neglected this aspect, and that is. We let people bounce at the altar and we don't have enough discernment to know whether they got right with God or not. We don't. We don't have enough discernment to fill a thimble. And then when they get up, we we clap for them. Yeah, you got saved. We put on a report. They got saved. They got saved. They've only been saved here 15 times. But that's okay. Brother Travis talked about that one time up here. We're tired of that stuff. Folks, Our job is to proclaim the gospel. God can get a hold of them. The Holy Ghost will convert them and clean them up through the blood of Jesus Christ. They shouldn't have to get saved but once. And if the church is doing its job of discipling people, they won't have to get saved but once. Because what we do, just like these people coming out from under the cloud of their substance abuse, we turn them loose and say, Fly! Fly away and be free. And they go, what am I supposed to do? And you yell, flap! (laughs) And that's our method of discipleship. I learned by the school of hard knocks, so can they. Folks, we're supposed to inform one another. We're supposed to encourage one another. We're supposed to teach one another. Am I done? I believe I'm done. I come across that poem. I'm not going to waste any time on that because I'm out of time. But John chapter 8, verse 36 says, If the Son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. He doesn't set us free. He makes us free. The truth doesn't set us free. The truth makes us free. You, if, you come in, if you come in contact with the Son, I mean, you come really face to face with Jesus Christ, He will make you free. Because yeah. you'll, you'll have two choices. You'll either get right or you'll walk away. So what's happening? Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men to me. All men. Are we not doing a great enough, good enough job of lifting up Christ? Maybe not. Maybe we're not letting the people that come into this church come face to face with the real risen Savior. Because if they come face to face with Him, He will either make them free or they'll walk out knowing that they rejected Him. They won't walk out with this happy feeling, oh, well, that was a good service. Man, they ought to be dancing in their pews with this comfort. Like they said on a fire ant hill. The Holy Ghost ought to be in here convicting spirit, convicting people. And if they, I'm not talking about not loving them, folks. We love them, but it ain't our job to convict. It's the Holy Ghost's job to convict. And if He's here, He'll convict. He'll either encourage us or convict us one, and He'll either draw people to the altar or they'll run out the back door and never want to come back. And you, at least we won't have to counter. Oh yeah, I got saved. I'm saved. I went up the altar and cried a little bit. I blew my nose in the handkerchief and I had to redo my mascara. <laughs> Let's change the order of service of prayer. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to be in your house. We thank you for your grace and your mercy. 
Lord, I pray that you will grant to us once again a desire for discernment in your house and that you'll give us the strength to stand in the face of adversity because, Lord, this, this, these bondages seek to re-enslave us.